Well, good morning, B booktube world. <clears throat> uh, I'm sitting here. It is the last day of February 2017. It is the 28th of February. It is 8.20 at... It's 8.20 in the morning here in West Michigan. I'm sitting here waking up to another day. And... Um, Drinking coffee, writing in my in my diary this morning. I'm on page 186. I already got my March 2017 diary ready. To uh, got the month here. It says here on the second, which is Thursday, Carol. My wife comes home from Phoenix, Arizona. So yeah, I got March already. And tonight I'll put my February 2017 diary down into lower level into a storage bin that will gather dust. So yeah, so I was uh, thinking about what books to show you. Yesterday I left the house to go get some groceries and then I visit thrift stores and I got a lot of used books but I can show those in another video but what I want to show this morning <clears throat> is um, I've been sh showing this book out that in the mornings in my devotions times in my times when I s seek the Lord and read the Bible and pray and sit in silence and meditate upon God's truth. I've been reading off and on this uh, new translation of this work of the exposition, the Heidelberg Catechism. <coughs> Excuse me. The Christian's only comfort in life and death in exposition, the Heidelberg Catechism, volume one by Theodor, Theodorus van der Groot. Uh, it says that uh, he was born in 1705 and he died in 1786. And uh, it, but this is translated by um, Bartel Esterhout. Now, every time I I hear that he translate this work out of Dutch, Bartel Bartel. That's the how I think of something else he translated for the uh, out of Dutch, and I wanted to show that this morning is that he translated this classic Dutch Puritan work that is called the Christian's Reasonable Service. It's it's really massive. It's like it's huge. It's all over. I don't know. It's at least over a thousand pages. I mean, volume one has, <coughs> volume one has, um, how many pages? 600 and almost 660. This has about 690. Volume three has about 600 and the last volume has oh about 566 so it's over 2,000 pages and I show these to show you that like I said for many years uh, when I became a Christian in 1970 I read the Bible for many years I was a young young Christian and I was in the Jesus movement there in California, and I just read the Bible, and and I went to Bible studies, and I I went to a Baptist church, and I was involved in a Christian commune and different Christian communes, and and then I uh, worked in a rescue mission on staff, where I began to teach the Bible and exhort or. Hate to use the word preaching, 
But, and then I went to, around 1977, I left California in 78, went to Bible College, and it's where I met my wife, Carol. And so the point is, is that in all those years, well, then I started reading the Puritans around 1975, 76. And I read the English Puritans, and this is one of the English Puritan books. I'll just give an example. This is The True Christian's Love to the Unseen Christ by Thomas Vincent. He was born in 1634 and he died in 1678. This is, uh, this is kind of material that I would read. And the, I, but when I came to Grand Rapids, I got involved in the Netherdykes, which are Dutch Reformed people who are into the Dutch Puritans. You have the English Puritans, but then at the same time that what was going on in England was going on the same, same thing in the Netherlands. And so you have these, because some of the Puritans were being, when they were being persecuted by the Church of England, they w would f flee to the Netherlands because it's like they went to exile to escape persecution. And there were churches there where they would set up preaching. And they, and what was going on among the English Puritans, a revival of biblical piety also was happening among Christians there in the Netherlands there in the 17th century. And this is where Brockle comes in. Brockle was uh, one of the, he, uh, he's one of the most famous of the Dutch Reformed Puritans. And this is his, it's like in the first volume, you have like, it's kind of like a systematic theology in a way but it's more along practical Christian living kind of thing. He doesn't just set forth doctrine in a cold intellectual way. He seeks to apply it to the Christian life, to, to everyday life. Like he will, like, but like in the first volume, he talks about the different doctrines of God, like ecclesiology, sociology, Anthropology, Christology, theology, but then he tries to bring it down to how it affects our lives. And um, but I just bring this out because if you want something really good Christian literature, like, that's, like I said, there's all kinds of secular literature out there. But what what should a Christian read? What should a Christian have in his library? Now you might have, you might read uh, secular philosophy. You might read books on, uh, maybe you're into science or maybe you're into uh, building boats or maybe you're into fishing. And so you buy the best books about how to fish, or how to build boats, or how to maybe maybe you're into woodwork and you want to you want books on wood woodworking. Well, if you're a Christian, what you want a, a good book on how, to, how what does it mean to walk with God and to know God? Was it how how we're to live in this world as Christians? And and this is a good thing to have. You can buy these and and from the Reformation Heritage Book Service. So I recommend The Reasonable Service. Uh, I bought, these came out in 1992. And I've been, I've read them for years and I still read them. But also, uh, Beaky, uh, the, 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 the Reformation Heritage Books, they put out this series too which I recommend. These are classics of Reformed spirituality. I was thinking of these yet when I was, when I read from the, this exposition on Lord's Day 7 by Vander Kruel. There was also 
these are another works by the uh, Dutch Puritans. And this is a whole series that the people who published this also translate these out of Dutch into English. And uh, I was reading this one yesterday, The Path of True Godliness by William Tinkelik. I can't pronounce these Dutch names, but he was a minister that from 1579 to 1629 was a pastor and a prolific writer who helped move the Reformed Church beyond matters of doctrine policy to Reformation life and practice. So you have that one, The Path of True Godliness. And this is one on the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him profiting from the Lord's Supper by Gallimus Sandus uh, by William S. S. Bracco, who wrote the Reasonable Service. And there's another one, The Spiritual Appeal to Christ's Bride by Jacques van Logens Logenstein. He was from 1620 to 1677. And then you have The Marks of God's Children uh, by Jean Taffin. This is translated by Peter Y. D. Young. He lived from 1529 to 1602. Then you have one on spiritual desertion by Gerbertus Vatis by Johannes Hockenbeek, translated by John Vreen and Harry Boonstra. And then this one here, The Practice of Faith, Hope, and Love by Godfrius Utemans, translated by Amy Gudenbacher. I can't pronounce these Dutch names. But I'm just saying, if you want some good Christian literature to read in the mornings, these are really worth having in your library. Uh, like you can see, I'm always reading them. I'm always reading Brocco. I go through, you know, I go through periods where I read academic Christian literature, you know, I read, but then I want something that's kind of more Christian spirituality, so that I get these out. And so, yeah, this is what I'm reading this morning. I really like this, uh, th this Puritan work, the true Christian's love to unseen Christ and it's like he says here, uh, it says, uh, why should a Christian, it says the seven things to show why true Christians love Christ whom they have never seen. He says reason number two, true Christians love an unseen Christ because of the lovingness of Christ, which lovingness, though it is not and cannot here be seen by the eye of the body, yet is evident unto the eye of faith. See the description which is given of Christ that the beloved by his spouse, the church, the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 9. The daughters of Jerusalem there inquire of the lovesick spouse, What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? What is thy beloved more than another beloved, thou dost so charges? Hereupon the spouse gives a description, verse 10. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among ten thousand. And after she had set forth his graces, beauties, and excellency accomplishments and metaphors taken from beauties in the several parts of man's body in the 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th verses, she concludes in verse 15 and 16 verses, his countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars, his mouth is most sweet. Yeah, he's altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. The spouse is here acknowledged to be the fairest among women, not only the daughters of Jerusalem, but her beloved, who had a more curious eye, both commends her loveliness and admires it. In chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Tarzar, comely as Jerusalem. Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. In verse 10, Who is this that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. But what beauty is there then in the beloved? 
If the church is beautiful beyond all other children of men, how beautiful is Jesus Christ from whom the church derives all his comeliness. He is said to be white and ruddy. This That shows the beauty of his face. His countenance is said to be as Lebanon and like the lofty cedars thereof. That shows the majesty of his face. His mouth is said to be most sweet. And sweet it is indeed in regard to the grit of the gracious words proceeds from it. No doctrine so sweet as Christ's doctrine. No precept so sweet as Christ's precepts. No promises so sweet as Christ's promises. But to sum up all excellencies and perfections in the word, he is said to be altogether lovely. There is no person or thing in the world that is most lovely, which can be properly be called altogether lovely. Many defects may be found in the most admirable persons, and such insufficiency may be found in the most desirable things. But Christ is altogether lovely, unlovely in no respect, there being no spot or blemish, no defect or imperfections we found in him. And he is lovely in every respect. There is an incomparable, transcendent ambleness in Christ's person in every regard. In the person of Christ, the human nature and the divine nature are in conjunction. He is most lovely in regard both. His human nature is compounded of both body and soul. His body is most beautiful, a most glorious beauty, and luster is put upon it. Whatever it was in his state of humiliation, be sure it has glorious beauty now in his state of exaltation. It is called a glorious body in Philippians 3, verse 21. If the face of Moses shone in resplendent glory after his conversing forty days with God in Mount Sinai, which was below, how does the body of Christ shine, which has been over 1,700 years in Mount Zion, which is above? I am persuaded that Christ's body is the most beautiful of all visible creatures, but the beauty of Christ's soul excels. But the beauty of Christ's soul excels. No creature, whatever, has such shiny excellencies as are in the soul of Christ. All the excellencies that are or ever were in any creature are like the feather laid in balance with the exceeding weight of his glorious excellencies and perfections. Christ excelled the most excellent men that ever lived as to the spiritual endowments when he was here upon earth. He excelled Moses in meekness, Solomon in wisdom, Job in patience. How does he excel now that he is in heaven? He excels not only the spirits of just men made perfect, but also the most glorious and holiest angels that never sin. If any creature have wisdom, it is but a beam. Christ is the sun. If they have goodness, it is but a drop, and Christ is the ocean. If they have holiness, it is but a spark or a sh dark shadow. Christ is the brightness of his Father's glory. If they have the Spirit, they have it but in some measure. The Spirit is given to Christ without measure. John 3, verse 34. And then he goes on and on. So that's a kind of, kind of reading that you find in the 17th century Puritans, that you find in the Dutch... The Dutch Puritans and, and their writings and it's good, it's good to read that stuff in the morning when you're surrounded in this world by things that are so so ugly and so decadent that you can sit and just by the eye of faith see the glory and the beauty of Christ that is revealed in the Word of God in the Bible and it's good to read books like Brocco on, on Christian's Reasonable Service just to get a, a full comprehensive understanding of of spiritual realities. So I just thought I'd bring these things up this morning. If you're looking for something good to read in the mornings that is more edifying and encouraging and help you in your spiritual life. It's good to read the High Son. I know maybe some of you people are not under Heidelberg Catechism, but it, it's good to read that stuff. It, it, it. So I just thought I'd share that this morning. And I'll, in another video, I'll show about those books I got at the thrift store yesterday. I just thought I'd show you what I read in the morning for devotions and what is good good Christian literature or just good books, spiritual books. You know, if you go to any, if you go to Barnes & Noble or any kind of retail, you see all kinds of, quote, spiritual books, spirituality, but you can't go wrong reading these books. So... Until next time, hoping you're having a, a good week and 
that you'll have a good month throughout the March 2017. So until next time, bye.